Greetings and a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for taking out time to attend the launch webinar of the Indian State's Electricity Transition Report. Today, it is our pleasure to share the findings from the second edition of this annual work being undertaken by IEFA, which is Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis and AMBER. We launched the first edition back in February 2023, and the findings of the report is now available at both IFAS and AMBER's website. I would encourage everyone to please go through the findings and look through the previous year's report also. Though, I would also like to say that looking at the dynamic nature of the power sector and the changing regulatory landscape at the state level, we have made some revisions to our methodology this year. I, along with the other lead authors, Ms. Tanya Rana from IEFA and Mr. Nishwin Rodericks from Ember, will walk you through the changes and the findings in a few minutes. We all know how the global electricity economy is changing at a fast pace, and India is at the forefront of this change, with the target to convert 50% of accumulative power generation green by 2030. A number of developments have happened and are happening as we speak, both at the center and state level. These include increasing the investment in the transmission infrastructure, improving grid integration of renewable energy technologies, uh, a number of power sector reforms, both at the center and state level. We have also seen progress in the uptake of decentralized renewable energy deployment at state level. We have also seen promotion of solar pumps for agricultural needs and enhancing storage solutions to meet the peak power requirement, both at the center and state level. But the big question is, how do we track and monitor the progress of all these developments? The success will depend on the implementation at the state, state level. And hence, we felt that it is necessary and critical to undertake such studies to understand where the states stand right now on the transition ladder. Considering this is a data intensive exercise, looking at several nuances that are dynamic in nature, the performance of each state will see variations from one year to another. And that is the beauty of such a study that we highlight these state level nuances. Though not a lot of direct comparison can be drawn from the last year's version and this year's version, as the methodology and parameters have changed a bit, uh, based on the inputs we received from a lot of sectoral experts and a state level regulatory changes. Going forward, but we hope to track these yearly changes in the upcoming editions. Having said that, I will quickly lay down the flow of the webinar for everyone's benefit. As mentioned before, we will now have a brief presentation by the report authors, followed by a moderated panel discussion by Ms. Vibhuti Garg, Director, South Asia IEFA. It is our pleasure to have a group of esteemed panelists with us today. Post the panel discussion, we will have scheduled time for Q&A. I would request everyone to please hold on to their questions till the end of the panel discussion and also post them in the Q&A box. Last but not the least, we will have the concluding remarks by Mr. Adit Pelola, Asia Policy Director, Amber. And with that context setting, I will now start the presentation along with my other co-authors. I'll quickly share my screen. Uh, Tanya, could you please confirm if the screen is visible? Yes, sir, only it's visible. Okay. As I said earlier, this year's report, which is State Electricity Transition Report 2024, and the previous edition and the upcoming editions, all aim to track and monitor the performance of Indian states and to understand how the states are walking their electricity transition pathway. This year, we also made an effort to update the methodology of, and the parameters of the last year and make necessary additions and deletions based on the inputs we received from stakeholders. One another big objective this year was to expand the boundaries and add more states to the analysis. I will talk about uh, this in detail in the upcoming slides. Having said that, we strongly believe that data has a lot of strength to empower the states with the right knowledge to make much more informed decisions. And going forward, hence such an analysis will be very crucial, very crucial to give data-backed insights. 
in this particular slide, I will quickly walk you through the changes that have happened from the previous edition to this edition. As I mentioned earlier, we have expanded the states from 16 to 21. These new 21 states now contribute to 95% of India's annual demand as per the Central Electricity Authority's data. And this was considering the last seven financial years. So basically five new states were added this year, which are Kerala, Uttarakhand, Assam, Himachal Pradesh, and Jharkhand. At the dimension level, we had four dimensions last year, and this year we have three. The first dimension that is decarbonization remains the same. The second dimension, which is performance of power system and readiness of the power ecosystem, the two and third, the second and the third dimension from last year's report was combined to form one dimension this year. This was based on the inputs we received from stakeholders and also to give a much more robust boundary to the methodology. The fourth dimension from last year, which is policies and political commitments, captured a lot of qualitative parameters. But this year, we got a lot of data for some of those parameters, and we added a lot of new uh, parameters that captured enablers existing in the state-level ecosystem to accelerate more RE deployment. Hence, the nomenclature was changed to market enablers. At the parameter level changes, so this year, we're looking at 18 parameters across the three dimensions. Eight new uh, parameters were added, and 10 new continued from last year. But one caveat here being the 10 parameter that remained same from last year's edition also have some minor uh, changes based maybe on from where we're drawing the sources of that data or in the mode of measurement. For example, we, will, we are looking at this comp performance as one of the parameter. Last year, we were getting the source from Niti Aayog's state and climate report. But this year, we are getting the discom performance data set from the annual integrated report from PFC, which was released in March 2024. In terms of new additions, uh, we also strongly felt a lot of development has happened at the state level and new parameters need to be added. Hence, we have now we are now looking at uptake of distributed solar energy, how well the states are developing their electric vehicle ecosystem, also how the states are utilizing their public funds to expand more renewable energy deployment. My co-author Tana will talk about this year's methodology and parameters in the upcoming slide. Uh, and with that high level uh, information and context on the report setting, I would just like to reemphasize again that this is a dynamic and data intensive exercise. And both the organizations have put in a lot of effort to collect the right data set, clean the right data set, and ensure that we're reaching out to a number of stakeholders to vet our methodology and get inputs on the insights. Uh, and with that, I will now hand over to Tane and Nishwin to walk you through the dimension level insights and methodology. Thank you, Saloni. Uh, I'll take the presentation forward by introducing the framework uh, that we adopted in our report. In our analysis, uh, we developed a comprehensive framework consisting of three dimension and 18 parameters in total, six parameters per dimension to evaluate states' efforts towards a cleaner energy transition. As Saloni mentioned, the framework, methodology, and weightages were finalized after thorough discussion with sectoral uh, experts. We are open to sharing the raw data sheet with you all upon request. And for more details on the parameters and weightages of our last year's report and this year's analysis set 2024, I would request you to go through the reports. Uh, before diving into the dimension level findings, which will be done by my co-author Nashwin, I would like to give you an overview for each dimension. Firstly, talking about our first dimension, which is decarbonization. Uh, what we did was we assessed states' progress towards renewable energy uptake and ensuring more energy efficiency. This is captured by various parameters, including the utilization of renewable energy potential and proportion of renewable energy mix in states' consumption. And then moving forward to the next dimension, which is readiness and performance of the power ecosystem. Uh, this dimension particularly analyzes and evaluates the state's power system and the ecosystem surrounding it, because this is very integral in transitioning of a state towards cleaner and more sustainable energy sources. The parameter considered in this dimension are selected to provide an overall and comprehensive assessment of various aspects of the power ecosystem. 
this is done by evaluating distribution utilities uh, of the states and their performance and states participation in short term electricity market and green markets like gdam green day ahead market it also delves into assessing the decentralized energy uptake and this is considered very essential uh, and plays a very vital role in promoting the inclusivity in cleaner energy transition uh, the first two dimension that i talked about till now are more data intensive and quantitative in nature uh, the last dimension that i'll uh, discuss now is market enablers which is a mix of both uh, quantitative and qualitative parameters. Market enablers delves into the nuances and concepts of a conducive uh, environment, which is essential for the adoption of renewable energy. The dimension sheds lights on key mechanisms such as incremental green tariff and regulatory frameworks, specifically designed to incentivize the transition. These mechanisms not only encourage the investment in renewable energy uh, infrastructure, but also stimulate the consumer's demand for cleaner energy alternatives. Also highlighting that the parameters that are discussed and are included in all these three dimensions are either directly or indirectly proportional to the score that is given to a particular state at parameter level. For example, if we look at power sector emission intensity under dimension one, which is decarbonization, lower the emission intensity of a state, uh, translate into better the state is performing in that diam uh, parameter. On the other hand, parameters like uptake of distributed energy or uh, solar energy that is under dimension two, uh, the higher uptake translate into better performance of the state under that parameter. I would also like to conclude by highlighting again that this framework is uh, expandable and dynamic in nature and is subject to the changes that will occur in the power sector and the feedback that we will re receive today and later on on our report and such insight and feedbacks will be incorporated in our next year report and framework. I'll stop here and request Nishwin to uh, walk you through the dimension level findings. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Uh... So in the next three slides, uh, we will focus on the results for each uh, dimension uh, for different states. Now, before I uh, go ahead with that, I just want to uh, reiterate what uh, Tanya mentioned and that the parameters here that describe a state's performance in a particular dimension have a weighted influence on the dimension level performance. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, different parameters have different uh, uh, influence on uh, each dimension. Uh, another thing here is that uh, in some parameters, few states perform very well as compared to other states. And uh, these two aspects kind of influence uh, the results at a dimension level. Uh, so starting with uh, the dimension one, uh, the interesting thing that we observe here is that uh, the top performing states uh, have done well in two or three uh, of uh, these parameters. Uh, Karnataka, for example, meets 36% of its total electricity demand from our resources. And if you consider the contribution of solar and wind, uh, it is uh, around 23%, which is one of the highest in the country. Uh, also improving on last year's uh, 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 state energy efficiency index, uh, Karnataka continues to be a front runner in the state energy efficiency index. Uh, and it performs very well in uh, uh, the building sector, in industry, as well as discom. And all these three uh, sectors are expected to be very important when it comes to uh, the state electricity transition. Uh, Karnataka also has the fifth highest uh, solar and wind capacity addition among states. Uh, it has added around three and a half gigawatts of solar and wind since 2020. And uh, it lags behind only states like Rajasthan, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and uh, Maharashtra. Uh, very similar to Karnataka, Kerala uh, also consumes a very high share of RE and is a front runner uh, state in the state energy efficiency index. Uh, both these uh, aspects kind of drive uh, the top uh, performers in this uh, dimension. Uh, also interesting to note uh, here is that uh, uh, states that have an abundant share of RE uh, of hydro perform well in this dimension. 
uh, and also because of a corresponding low emission intensity. So I'm talking about states like uh, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand that meet a major portion of their electricity demand through hydro. Uh, what might be a surprise in this dimension is the performance of states like uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat. Uh, we do acknowledge that these states account for uh, more than 55% of the total RE capacity that has been added uh, since 2020. Uh, for example, Rajasthan has added uh, around uh, 16 gigawatts and Gujarat has added around 12 gigawatts of the total uh, 50 odd gigawatts that India has added in the uh, since 2020. Uh, that being said, uh, a, a lower RE consumption in Gujarat and a lower state energy efficiency index uh, in Gujarat and Rajasthan, especially Rajasthan, have influenced uh, their performance in this dimension. Uh, uh, although just wanted to uh, uh, mention that uh, Rajasthan's low score in SEI is because uh, of uh, the uh, is mainly attributed to the lack of reported data, and that's what the SEI claims. Uh, another interesting point is although both these states have contributed significantly to RE additions, there is still potential for growth in terms of capacity addition, uh, and we see that in the utilized uh, renewable energy potential uh, parameter. Coming to the eastern states, we uh, do note that many of these states uh, perform well in some parameters, uh, but uh, in general, they tend to have a much lower renewable energy consumption uh, as well as uh, capacity addition in the state. Uh, interestingly, all uh, or most states have uh, uh, witnessed a notable progress in this particular dimension since last year. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Silvan? Okay, uh, so now we come to the dimension two results, that is uh, the results on the readiness and performance of the power ecosystem. Uh, and uh, here we observe interestingly that the overall performance is influenced by the discount level performance. And uh, this can be seen if we compare the color shade of the overall dimension as well as the discount uh, uh, performance. Uh, states like uh, Gujarat, uh, Delhi and Haryana follow this norm. And uh, Delhi also performs uh, extremely well in terms of its progress towards distributed solar. Uh, Delhi also has a much higher share of short-term market purchases and this drives its performance in this uh, uh, particular dimension. Uh, uh, that being said, there are some ex exceptions wherein states that have a very strong uh, discount rating may not necessarily perform well uh, here. And this is largely attributed to a very low performance in uh, the other parameters in this dimension. Uh, an example here would be Odisha. Uh, Odisha, for example, has the third highest uh, DISCOM rating. It has made a lot of progress in terms of reducing its uh, uh, billing efficiency uh, as per the latest uh, PFC report. Uh, but it does lack uh, in performance when it comes to distributed uh, solar as well as uh, short-term market participation. Uh, and here, therefore, the uh, overall dimension performance doesn't align uh, entirely with the discom level performance. Uh, states like Jharkhand, uh, Tamil Nadu, and Bihar follow the norm. Uh, that is uh, the relationship between the discom performance and the overall performance in this dimension. Uh, Jharkhand, for example, has had uh, problems when it comes to improving its billing efficiency. Uh, Bihar, on the other hand, is interesting. It has actually improved its billing efficiency in uh, uh, recent years. But overall, it uh, still has a lower discount performance, and that's why it uh, has an overall lower performance in this dimension. Uh, Jharkhand, uh, if you look at Jharkhand's uh, adequacy of power supply, Jharkhand also has more power deficits than any other country, uh, creating a stark difference there. Uh, Another interesting uh, parameter here is the electricity intensity of GDP. Uh, now, what we have considered here is the electricity consumption and not the total energy consumption. Uh, that being said, uh, states like Kerala, Karnataka, and Assam consume the lowest electricity per unit of GDP, uh, which also reflects in a very in a much higher uh, SEI uh, score as compared to other states. And interestingly, these states have also improved on the SEI index. Uh, 
uh, in in recent years. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Saloni? Yeah, coming to uh, dimension three, uh, here we look at what the market enablers are. And uh, in this dimension, the performance is uh, influenced by uh, whether a state has implemented the green open access regulation, which we feel is an important aspect when it comes to market enablers. Uh, we also see whether a state has an active RE target and uh, uh, whether uh, and on the availability and attractiveness of green tariffs in the state. Uh, but uh, so when I talk about green tariffs, we are talking about how much extra are discoms allowed to charge uh, for green electricity above the existing tariff. Uh, but this one thing that I wanted to highlight here is that it is, especially in this dimension, it is difficult to compare across states. Uh, uh, especially, for example, uh, say if a state has announced the adoption of a green open access regulation. Uh, the aspects of, of that announced uh, regulation might vary across states. And this might make something like open access more or uh, less attractive in different states. Uh, but this is a limitation here, but this is something that is difficult to capture in a uh, dimension level assessment across states, especially as assessment like this that looks more broadly across uh, different states and different parameters. Uh, that being said, let's go back to the results uh, for uh, this dimension. Here we see that Odisha is a top performer here, uh, owing to the lowest incremental green tariff, much lower than even hydro rich states. Uh, here, o Odisha also has a very strong regulatory ecosystem for DSO implementation, uh, which might be important as the penetration of renewables increases. Uh, Odisha also has a very attractive EV policy uh, that results in a uh, uh, you know relatively higher EV growth. Uh, Delhi is uh, uh, Delhi's performance in this dimension is actually quite interesting. Uh, it has a very strong EV ecosystem, uh, leading to a very high EV adoption rate uh, uh, in this uh, in in the financial year 2023. Uh, that being said, it does lack in other aspects of uh, this dimension, owing to its overall uh, lower performance here. Uh, Kerala is also interesting here, despite having a, a performing extremely well in uh, the first two dimensions, its performance here is relatively lower. Uh, and this is because it does not have an active RE policy and it has not yet adopted uh, the green open access regulation. Uh, that being said, what we've highlighted in these three uh, dimensions are insights that we thought are interesting, right? But I do encourage you to go through our report as well as the data because uh, each state, depending on uh, the data that you have collected, tells an entirely different story, right? And I think uh, there are interesting insights that you could pick up from that. Uh, that being said, I'll hand it over to Saloni to uh, summarize our findings. Thank you so much, uh, Nishwin, for highlighting the dimension level insights. Uh, I'll start by saying that we acknowledge and applaud the tremendous efforts that a lot of states are making to walk the electricity transition pathway. And what this slide does here is brings all the three dimensions that Nishwin just explains together and gives a snapshot of how the positioning of each state is changing from one dimension to another, that is across the dimensions, and also how the states are performing relative to each other within the dimension. So we have tried to depict it using a heat map. And at a very high level, I would like to share some key findings and observations, uh, starting with Karnataka and Gujarat. If you look at these two states, they showcase strong performance across the dimension since they have progressive policy in place, they have the enabling ecosystem. There was a lot number of factors that Nishwin mentioned for Karnataka and Gujarat. If you look closer at Karnataka, we say we see that the Karnataka is performing well under the dimension one, which is decarbonization, and the third dimension, which is market enablers. Though the state's performance declined a little bit under the th uh, second dimension, which is readiness and performance of power ecosystem. And the reasoning for that is the low discom rating that the state has been getting from uh, PFC. So this year also the state's discom performance declined a little bit. If we now look at Gujarat, uh, it is interesting that even though the state has added approximately 12 gigawatt of RE capacity since 2020, uh, 20 till February 2024, the state has just utilized 12% of its RE potential. 
and that impacts the state's score under the first bucket, which is decarbonization, that first dimension. But the state, if you look at the other two dimensions in the heat map, the state is doing well in those two dimensions. Another key interesting point that I would like to highlight uh, for Gujarat is that if you look at the decentralized solar uptake in the state, it stands at 15% of its renewable energy capacity. So with a 15% decentralized solar uptake and only uh, capturing 12% of its RE potential, it shows how much uh, capacity the state still holds in order to expand its renewable energy uh, potential. So yeah, there is a lot of effort that is still needed even in states that are performing really well. The second interesting observation was states like Kerala, Haryana, Andhra Pradesh and Punjab. They emerge as front runners and they are performing uh, considerably well under at least two dimensions out of the three considered in this study. If you look at a closer uh, look at Kerala, we see that Kerala performs well under the first dimension that is decarbonization and also uh, the second dimension that is readiness and performance of the power ecosystem. But its performance is not up to the mark uh, in the third dimension, which is market enablers. And the reason for that is that in spite that the state has high RE consumption that stands at 29%, which is the fourth highest amongst the states considered in this dimension, the state does not have the right market enablers in place yet. So if the state is able to do that, we can see much more progress in the upcoming editions of this report. So the state's participation in short term market and green uh, day ahead market is comparatively low. Absence of a renewable energy policy and non-adoption of green open access rules also impacts the state's performance under the third dimension, which is market enablers. Uh, I think it's also interesting to look at Haryana uh, because Haryana is also performing well under the first two dimensions with uh, adding approximately 1.1 gigawatts of RE capacity since 2020. And the state has also utilized its RE potential, which stands at 25%. But the state's RE policy expired back in 2022. So they, the state does not have an active RE policy in place and that impacted the state's scores under the market enablers dimension. Andhra Pradesh and Punjab are also other states that are uh, in front runners. Andhra Pradesh uh, is approximately mid-tabled across the three dimensions, considering its lower RE potential, which stands at 8%. In fact, the uptake of this Decentralized solar uh, energy is also very low in the state, which stands at approximately 2.3%. But the only reason that the state is doing well is because the state has the right market enablers in place. The state has a progressive RE policy with structured targets. The state has also adopted green open access rules. That leads to a better overall performance of the state across the three dimensions. Uh, if we see Punjab, uh, it's uh, interesting to see how the performance is uh, varying and declining all across the three dimensions. It is doing well in the dimension one, and then it declines across the other two dimensions, owing to the declining discom rating of the state, also the green uh, low green market participation uh, in GDAM, which is green day hair market, which just stands at approximately 1.8%. In addition, the absence of RE policy also impacts so I think overall what we in one bucket but there's absence of market enablers and it's also the other way around so going forward a states that are performing well also need to increase their RE uptake and the other states that are considerably mid-tabled need to create the right market enablers and the ecosystem in their state last but not the least states like Jharkhand, Bihar, West Bengal and Uttar Pradesh uh, showcased slow progress in most of the parameters uh, this year. And they also showcased slow progress in the previous ed edition, in spite of the fact that few parameters were added and deleted. And I think this one already highlighted few reasoning to that. So I won't uh, go into those details right now. But as Nishwin said, we would really encourage everyone to please go through the report and go through the state level insights and data sheets to get much more detailed information around the state level performance. Uh, with that, uh, based on these analysis and findings, we also came up with some high-level recommendations. Uh, though these are very broad recommendations, uh, there are much more detailedly captured in the report, and I would request everyone to go through the report. But we believe that we efforts are needed in three major buckets. One, strengthening the state-level regulatory ecosystem. Second, 
or it that in more state level studies a lot is happening at the state level but we believe one kiss, key missing maybe you can just switch off in order to uh, ensure saloni if you can just switch off your video your voice is cracking so maybe for better bandwidth yeah go ahead okay sorry yeah is uh, just let me know if you still uh, can't hear me but i'll continue what i was saying is that within the state level regulatory ecosystem a key missing aspect is proper resource advocacy planning at the state level and there's no question that such plans are required in order to ensure that ad adequate generation capacities are available for round the clock power availability and all also to meet the peak power requirements and despite the ministry of powers directive to all states and utilities to prepare resource advocacy guidelines only a few states like maharashtra punjab and madhya pradesh have notified such plans so there is a lot of scope for other states to come up with, with such plans and work is needed in that direction having said that in addition to better planning uh, on supply and demand there is also immense effort needed to strengthen the power market and the data from the state electricity transition report states that we see limited participation of states in short term electricity market and green market mechanisms like green day ahead market green term ahead market however uh, just one caveat here that for this particular study we've just looked at green day ahead markets data because the gtam data was not available in public domain but going forward uh, in the upcoming editions we will try to incorporate it uh, another welcoming step was introduction of distributed renewable energy segment as per, as part of the rpo obligation and which now allows renewable energy projects with the capacity less than 10 megawatt to qualify for rpo for distribution companies and open access consumers we believe it's a very good step and going forward what effort would be needed is to track and monitor the progress on this distributed re segment and the storage segment at the state level another key aspect is to ensure that the storage uh, capacity is increasing at the state level in order to meet the peak demand and this uh, should be technology agnostic based on the Uh, requirements available at the state uh, be it pump hydro storage large grid, grid scale projects round the clock tenders or behind the meters in terms of prioritizing state level studies uh, we believe that a lot is happening and this study is also an effort to do that uh, in the upcoming years but what we need to understand is that each state is uniquely placed with their own barriers own challenges own renewable energy resource profiles and their policy and regulatory ecosystem hence uh, developing customized state level action plans will be important going forward and the data insights that we are trying to provide in these reports will should help in creating these state level nuances and state level trajectories and plans also capacity building at state level of state authorities including uh, different state players state transmission utilities will be important going forward and also creating a platform to share a uh, knowledge and insights across the states will be important in order to ensure that much more informed decisions are made last but not the least enhancing state level data availability uh, this has been a challenge that we faced while conducting this the two editions of this study though i would like to emphasize that uh, our job was a little easier this year because much more data was available and i believe it will get easier in the upcoming years but there is effort needed at the state level to ensure much more transparent data is available maybe by utilizing more digitization uh, solutions or ensuring that the capacity building of the state authorities is done to capture the right data and then ensuring that data is available in public platforms uh and that i think these were the high level recommendations Uh, and i would like to close by saying and acknowledging as tanya and nishwan mentioned earlier that this is an expandable study and a dynamic one and much we understand that much more parameters and aspects and nuances related to electricity transition can be added and we would be really happy to get the feedback of experts today and going forward and make additions to the upcoming versions of this particular effort that both organizations are making I will also try. I uh, want to say thank you to my co-authors and the entire team of IFA and Amber for conducting this study. I know it was very data intensive. Uh, I would also 
say my gratitude to all the panelists and all the people who took out time to join the webinar and hear this presentation. And with that, I would now hand over to Vibhuti to initiate the panel discussion. Thank you, Nishwin, Saloni, and Tanya for the presentation and sharing the key findings of the report. Uh, it is really encouraging to see how some states are progressing well and are leading actually the decarbonization pathway, but still there is scope for them to improve in certain dimensions as we as was highlighted by the authors. Also, I think importantly, uh, the objectives was also that they offer important learnings for states which are on a similar pathway or you know, have really started their decarbonization journey a little late and, uh, than the other states. So now, uh, I think we did see some level of uh, comparison where the different states are, uh, but moving on to our next section, which is the panel discussion, we would like to hear more from the experts. But before I introduce our panelists, some housekeeping points, you know, I would request uh, all the panelists to keep their remarks to three to four minutes each. And specifically to journalists, you know, who are writing stories, who are listening to the webinar today and who have already received our press release. Uh, if you plan to cover this report um, and want to quote the authors or the panelists would encourage you to get it vetted from the concerned person or persons present here. And also uh, to all the participants who want to uh, get their queries answered, please, I've, I'm already seeing there are a lot of questions already in the Q&A box. I would request the authors to start answering them because it is more on the report so far. But going forward, please feel free to um, you know, put your questions in the Q&A box. We will try and answer and take up as many questions as we can towards the end. Um, but if you have specific questions uh, for specific panelists, please do identify who the question is directed to. Uh, with this, we'll move on um, and I'll quickly introduce our speakers. We, uh, our first speaker needs no introduction. We have Dr. Praveen Sinha, who is a seasoned power professional with an illustrious career spanning nearly four decades. Um, Dr. Sinha has held pivotal leadership roles across the power sector value chain. Uh, under his current leadership, you know, Tata Power is undergoing a profound transformation. We have already witnessed uh, with Tata Power taking over the Orissa Discom, uh, how the Orissa Discom's uh, Discom performance rating has improved. So uh, that's a true testimony of how, uh, you know, the ownership has led to huge changes. Uh, prior to his present role, he also served as the CEO and MD of Tata Power Daily Distribution Limited. He is the chairman of CII Western Region Council and is a member of other national committees working on Indian power sector reforms. In 2023, he received accolades for best CEO power sector uh, from Business Today and Fortune India for his contribution in building a greener and future ready India. Uh, and he's also chairman of Tata Projects. Next, we have Dr. Ritu Mathur. Dr. Mathur holds expertise in the climate, energy, and uh, development policy domains with three decades of experience you know, in uh, research, consultancy, and teaching in the areas of sustainable development, climate mitigation, energy, economic, and environment modeling at Terry and Terry School of Advanced Studies. Dr. Mathur has been associated also with the IPCC process as lead author and reviewer. Uh, Dr. Mathur is currently camped at Senior Economist, uh, Energy Economist at Niti Aayog, uh, as a, you know, being deputed from Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. Uh, we have Mr. Abhishek Ranjan, uh, who is a partner at uh, EY Parthenon. He's an experienced distribution utility professional with a focus on commercial and regulatory aspects. Um, as well as grid modernization, digital transformation, uh, customer experience related initiatives. He has about two decades of experience in the power um, and information technology sectors in India. Lastly, we have Ms. Vrinda Gupta. Ms. Vrinda is an associate director with Vasudha Foundation India. She has over 11 years of experience in informing policy and regulation to accelerate India's energy transition. 
At Vasudha, she's engaged in the strategic development uh, of Vasudha Power and Energy Program Portfolio. Apart from authoring numerous reports, she has spearheaded the development of India Climate Energy Dashboard, which is a flagship energy uh, initiative housed at Niti Aayog. Uh, before we begin the round of questions, I would want all the panelists to share their reflections on the report findings. Nothing elaborate, but just like in two minutes, what struck to them the most about uh, the report findings? Uh, I can hear the echo. I don't know what's wrong. Uh, but if we can start with you, uh, Dr. Sinha, uh, what was the key thing that stuck with you uh, when the report findings were presented? Uh, first of all, thank you, Vibhuti, and uh, uh, thank you to Aifa and Ember. And uh, my Huge compliment to Saloni, Tanya, and Nishwin for excellent report. Uh, as uh, was rightly mentioned in the presentation, that uh, this report basically covers uh, 21 states. Uh, most of the important states in the country have been covered. And uh, state-specific analysis has been done on the 18 parameters. And uh, I think uh, it has virtually, I went through the details of all the parameters and it virtually covers everything and it uh, gives a certain weightage to each one of them. We can, of course, discuss that the weightage should have been little more or less because each state has a unique challenge and a unique position. Like Delhi, you cannot have too much of uh, uh, distributed generation over there. You, you have very small space. And there are not so many independent houses over there compared to states like Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh or Gujarat, where the penetration of rooftop solar or distributed generation will be higher. Also, some states are more blessed in terms of the capacity of renewable that can be added. But I think generally, I would say that it has come out very well and it has given due importance and uh, weightage to all the so-called parameters uh, that needs to be covered. The 18 parameters actually gives you a lot of freedom to uh, identify what all uh, needs to be done, whether it is in terms of decarbonization or it is in terms of the readiness and performance of the uh, power utility and the power system, and also in terms of what are the market enablers. So I think uh, all in all, it's a very good report. Now, uh, my view was that while it has been done at uh, uh, at each state level and it is one generic report, uh, if one has to really take it to the next stage, uh, there is a general recommendation that has been there, but there has to be a recommendation state-wise, which uh, needs to be shared with each of the states. So Maharashtra will require a different set of recommendation compared to what Rajasthan or Punjab would require. And uh, uh, this should be taken up uh, with the concerned uh, government, which should be taken up with the uh, people in the regulatory system and also with the utilities so that uh, there is a much better appreciation of what all has been done and what all needs to be done. And I'm sure when you go through uh, the details with the, uh, with the states, you will find some of them are work in progress. They have already initiated some of the activities and some they will have to possibly initiate and expedite. So I think um, uh, the real benefit of this will be when it uh, gets transferred and translated to each of the states, their regulatory system, and, uh, and they identify these as shortcomings and which can be implemented. Also at the uh, in, uh, government of India level, uh, the new government is expected to come and the 100 days program of the new government is being made. Uh, some of the recommendations which the central government has to do, uh, some of the action points that they have to do, whether it is in terms of the RPO obligation, or it is in terms of uh, some of the other enablers in terms of the policy uh, to ensure that uh, now whether it is the PM Sorry Urja program, uh, I think those are, uh, or the markets that needs to be created, those are things uh, which um, uh, may be a good idea to take it up uh, with the government of India because uh, uh, since they, in next uh, three to four weeks, they would finalize that document. 
it will be very helpful because uh, there is definitely a big necessity to take up some of these issues. And uh, while we have done very well and we can pat on our back uh, that uh, from where to where we have come. And if you see in last seven, eight years, uh, the capacity ads have been phenomenal, but uh, it is much lesser than the run rate that we require. And uh, we know that if we have to be 500 gigawatt of non-carbon, we need to add 300 in the next seven and a half years. And uh, we need to actually double or maybe triple the pace at which the capacity ads are taking place. So um, uh, I, I think um, uh, um, the report has come out. I don't want to get into specific issues, but I think this report per se is a very, very uh, data intensive report that has come out very objective. And um, uh, I think you, you should make the best of it. Use some of the um, other channels such as the uh, CIIs and the FIKI and the ASHOCHEM Industry Association also to take it up with the government. And you should actually do more of the webinars, seminars in different cities and different places so that uh, the real benefit of the report uh, reaches uh, the so-called policy makers and the regulatory system and the and the utilities and the and the people who are in this sector and are working in this sector uh, uh, so that uh, the benefit of uh, the uh, tra energy transition is uh, received by everyone so i'll pause over yeah. here thank you your suggestion is very well taken on board and we did intend to you know start with the state level engagement because our uh, while it kind of summarizes and clubs a lot of states together, but there are definitely some state level uh, recommendations that we have identified um, and we are already started engaging with some states, but yes, we will do it more and we will definitely need the help of you, Dr. Martha, through Niti Aayog, who are also engaging at state level. We would definitely want to uh, take the findings of this study to as many states as possible. So thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Ranjan, I know you are on the way to a meeting, uh, maybe a quick reflection, and maybe then I can probably ask one or two questions from you before you leave in the next 10 minutes. Sorry about that. Please go ahead. Sure, we would be. Am I audible clearly? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, I'm very sorry I had to leave this last moment meeting, but then uh, congratulations to the entire team who has put up this report. And as Dr. Pravisina was mentioning, it has come out very well and insightful. In fact, uh, more insightful from the last time, the last edition in 2023. Uh, in, I don't want to repeat the parameters, for example, from four to three, and then each of the three dimensions, we have six, one of them, but very comprehensive that I see. All I want to echo uh, Dr. Sinha is in, in, in terms of how it can result into uh, meeting our target of 500 gigawatt by 2030. How can we accelerate maybe triple the rate, 18 gigawatt is the rate at which we added in 2023, 24. Uh, how we can triple that, uh, otherwise 500 gigawatt looks. Now, there are specific challenges. So last night I was talking to somebody in uh, IEC, uh, IECC basically. So uh, so where uh, the specific challenges, I think they have been made a parameter in one of those dimensions, for example, power system readiness and all. Specific States would require specific interventions and state-specific interventions against the dimension would be very, very crucial at the policy level and we have to pull all the strings. Having said that, uh, this is going to help in our, uh, some of the suggestions which I would make is, why can't this rating or this report can find a way as an input towards the overall discom rating which comes into play, okay, uh, which is brought up by MOP. So that could be one way where their credit ratings, et cetera, is being influenced by this kind of uh, energy transition rating as you are bringing it out. That is number one. And number two, uh, when this review happens, I, I think Honorable Power Minister also takes fortnightly review of the state's performance, et cetera. If this report can also become a part of that process, and then what are the recommendations over there, it can be taken up on a warp scale. Uh, that would be very, very helpful. And it will also enrich further the report with practical insights from the state as to what is stopping. I won't take much time here, but over to you, uh, Vibhuti. 
Thank you. Uh, before I move to Dr. Mathur and Brenda, maybe uh, since you have a time limit, uh, I just want to also check with you uh, on certain aspects, you know, uh, given your experience working with DISCOM earlier, then the private sector, and now with EY uh, Energy Group. People in North India are already experiencing very, very high temperatures. You know, yesterday we already had 206 gigawatt of peak demand. And as per the projection, you know, the peak demand is expected to increase by around 7% from 243 gigawatt to about 260 gigawatt this year. How do you think distribution utilities are prepared to meet their respective peak demands and how renewable energy in particular can play that role? So we are seeing that, you know, increasingly the uh, the SECI or NTPC who are coming up with the tenders, there is a shift from total va uh, uh, vanilla tenders to real time, uh, you know, RTC tenders or firm and dispatchable kind of tenders playing and meeting this demand. So what's your uh, view on uh, renewable energy kind of playing a key role in meeting the peak demand going forward? Thank you so much, Vivuti. Very relevant and pertinent question. In fact, we have a relevant uh, or relative regulatory framework in our country, you know, for example, resource adequacy guidelines. And then I think many of the states like MP, Maharashtra, Punjab, et cetera, they're having their own state specific resource adequacy regulation. But what I see over there is mainly it is focused on supply side. As you rightly said, the demand is galloping and 206 gigawatt now, we expect 350 gigawatt or even more by 2030. Who knows, I mean, it comes before thanks to the GDP growing, right? So, and the heat going and the cold load or cooling load increasing. Now, uh, utilities, obviously they are tying up power and peak power, et cetera. And you mentioned about the different constructs of renewable energy. Thanks to the storage cost coming down, you see a lot of standalone storage tenders also. The recent one was GUBNL. And we see a flurry of such tenders coming in, uh, which are going to be immediate. Unlike PSP, which is going to take some time. And you know, one estimate says that we would have significant PSP in our kitty by say 2030 or so. By then, much of the time would have elapsed when we are adding uh, renewable energy, right? It's 500 gigawatt. But I would like to emphasize on two very important levers that we have, which has been given to us in our uh, resource adequacy framework by MOP and respective, and in fact, in CRC grid electricity code also, right? So which came into effect from 1st October last year, chapter two. Demand side interventions uh, now is a necessity and its contribution to the resource adequacy should be urgently quantified. And this is one of the factors I think resource adequacy is a parameter that you have undertaken. And there should be a more granular uh, focus on the demand side because this 206 gigawatt, if you see, uh, what is the duration for which it is there, right? So now, uh, one side of the story is you make this demand more efficient. So if I say efficient, would we have reduced this 206 to maybe 200 or 180 or 190? I don't know. Uh, with a demand side measure, uh, without jeopardizing the, uh, uh, the customers, basically, it should be voluntary. Second, when we are saying 206 gigawatt, this is the demand from the grid. So the demand can still be met, but not from the grid. How we can do that? Storage comes into play. So the storage deployment in the distribution area becomes very, very important. I think you have already captured that as a lever. If not specific to the distribution, becomes paramount. And that is help. go to help them is not only network planning, but also offsetting this peak, right? So that way, demand side interventions, including storage, uh, planning in the distribution standalone grid becomes very, very important, should be one of the important parameters to evaluate the readiness of the grid and readiness of the discoms to play. And last but not the least, yes, uh, tenders like FDRE, one of the results have come out, though the price looks high, 5.59, I'm talking about FDRE 2, Punjab plus MP. But if you do an analysis uh, behind the scene, you will find still it is cheaper. Uh, compared to like, for example, 5.59 for the next 25 years flat, compared to how you're going to meet the galloping demand. Right? The demand is not going to stay here today as of now. So that right. analysis also comes as a recommendation over to you. Thanks. 
Uh, absolutely. We clearly, you know, one of the big recommendations from the analysis was while there is a national level push uh, for states to come up with their resource adequacy, uh, but still, apart from very few states, you know, this initiative has not even started. Uh, so how do we kind of ensure that state do come up with their resource adequacy plan and as a result you know you rightly identified we don't know what kind of storage do they need whether they need long duration storage short duration storage and also in terms of infrastructure planning uh, evacuation infrastructure both at the transmission end and discom and i think that will come out very very clearly if the states undertake that exercise but so there's clearly a need to push states to undertake that uh, so thanks uh, for kind of highlighting that again. Uh, there's clearly that gap and uh, that's that will be one of our key recommendations when we take these findings to various states uh, in our interaction going forward. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Ranjan. I know uh, you might have to leave now, but thank you for being there and thank you so much for all your support in helping us frame the methodology, the weightages, uh, in the previous version, as well as in the, this version. Thank you for all your support right from the initiation of this report uh, to joining us as a panelist today. Thank you. My pleasure, Mivuti, and I am uh, obliged for you giving me this opportunity always here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Mathur, uh, quickly your reflection on the reports. Thank you, Vibhuti. So again, I just echo what uh, my co-panelists have already said. I think it's an excellent report and again brings in a lot of understanding at a state level uh, to look at, you know, which parameters have played out uh, uh, differently across uh, uh, the different states. And that's a very rich amalgamation of uh, knowledge in terms of understanding what works, what doesn't work uh, in, in some states, but also what uh, pushes, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, a particular state up in terms of how, how things work together vis-a-vis -vis different uh, parameters opposing each other. So I think there's a plethora of understanding that we can gain from the report. And again, I also echo uh, the, that you know, this needs to now go even more in depth at the state level uh, to become more policy relevant, and uh, for states to start uh, also looking at the action. So again, something which I've been saying for a, a long time: uh, we know the what, and now we need to move to the hows. So this kind of a report will be very useful in understanding how uh, to address the change, how to step up the acceleration of moving towards renewable and uh, clean energy uh, as we go forward, which is what are the places that uh, specific state, states need to work on and which challenges are to be overcome. So I think a lot of guidance can be uh, derived from uh, this exercise. And again, just uh, about uh, the study, uh, looking at you know how what you had last year and what you have now, clearly there's an amalgamation uh, and bringing together of uh, the power system performance and the readiness of the power ecosystem, which has been uh, you know brought together as one uh, uh, parameter this uh, this year, one line of thinking. But I think that's again telling me uh, you know how things are becoming more and more interconnected, and how you need to look at the overall ecosystem as a whole uh, going forward. So if you look at uh, you know, India's story uh, towards decarbonization, uh, I see it as uh, maybe the next year or going forward, uh, internalizing even more in terms of looking at the interconnectedness with regard to the land, water, jobs, et cetera. So uh, where does all of the power system uh, tra transition fit into the uh, overall India story of the transition and where are our interlinkages on all those fronts. In fact, even just transition and energy security, uh, when we talk of India's macro perspective, you know, other than the state level nuances that this report brings out, maybe the report can have a section where it also looks at that part of the story to weave in uh, where, where, you know, the states who are playing this game of um, helping us transition in the medium term, there are some which need to focus on uh, the, the uh, thermal part of the story uh, to help 
uh, transition all the way towards uh, RE, et cetera? Where does nuclear fit in? So I think this could be the other uh, takeaway that I wanted to uh, put in terms of uh, maybe the next report or uh, when you take it at the national level and the state level of interweaving these interconnectedness uh, across the entire energy ecosystem as well. So I'll stop with that for now. Absolutely. As as the authors were saying, it's dynamic. And, you know, uh, this time uh, we got a lot more data than what was available previously. So there's a lot of data tra transparency that is happening now, uh, thanks to different states and government initiative, central government initiative. Uh, uh, and also to answer that we definitely were trying to get a lot of data on transition financing as well and transition level data on just transition aspects but again due to lack of availability of data those parameters could not have been included in this version but hopefully with more data being available we will try and incorporate those aspects too. Um, one quick question Dr. Martha before I uh, move to Rinda. So you have been personally also involved in modeling and I remember our good old Terry days, uh, 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 you know, uh, now with, ne uh, with Niti Aayog as well, you have been involved in modeling and coming up with, you know, different, different scenarios, which include RE rich scenario, net zero scenario. While there is still some clarity of work happening at the national level, how do we ensure that it gets translated again to state level? We have discussed resource adequacy plans not being there at state level. Uh, and in terms of the kind of dimensions uh, and the parameters we were discussing for decarbonization, power system readiness, market enablers, how these how do we ensure these realities are taken into account when we are modeling transition pathways at a state level? Yeah, so again, uh, you know, looking at modeling and uh, scenarios, uh, when you look at, um, uh, you know, the broader directional scenarios uh, into the longer term future, I think pretty much all the models that we have out there or you know which are being done at the national level uh, as well um, tell you the similar kind of story you know in terms of needing to go towards uh, greater electrification in terms of needing to go towards re in terms of uh, looking at uh, the peak demand and planning for uh, some level of storage and so on but when you need to look at you know a, a, a more granular level say at the state level uh, again, it becomes more and more important to uh, get into the nuances of how the uh, system, uh, how the power system is likely to behave. And again, coming back to the interconnectedness, your demands will respond to what is happening in that particular region with regard to, say, uh, the, the uptake of electric vehicles what's happening with maybe electric cooking in the long term, cooling demands, et cetera. So uh, one, of course, is with regard to the data and the analysis that you will need to additionally uh, uh, bring in into uh, the models to look at these uh, nuances and these changes um, in the short to medium term as well, uh, to be able to address the state of readiness of uh, the power system and to be able to evaluate uh, the uh, the changes that you can bring in, uh, both on the supply side as, as well as on the demand side. So what is the requirement for management and whether the demand side management uh, can play a larger role or how it needs to go in tandem with what you can do on the supply side. All of that needs to be much better nuanced when we are looking at uh, state level and um, uh, scenarios which are going to help us in decision making on a day-to-day -day level, say from now to uh, 2030 and beyond. So I think uh, uh, that is where the entire scenario in the modeling arena is uh, needing to change. And which again brings me to, uh, you know, also the structures of the models. The structures need to become much more granular. The data needs to be much more uh, granular. And also maybe combining different kinds of uh, model, system dynamic models to look at which policy could help in a, um, in a better way uh, to respond vis-a-vis -vis, uh, another. Uh, so so, uh, so if there are 
methodological changes, there are data changes, there are linkages with policy. All of these nuances, I think, uh, need to be brought in uh, more and more uh, in an engaged manner as we look at uh, policy uh, linking up with better decision making. So I think I'll stop with that. I think definitely uh, those are the needs, but there is going to be big challenge in terms of uh, gaps in terms of capacity development. So I think uh, we will need to engage a lot more, helping them provide these models, helping them how to use these models on a continuous basis. So I think that's going to be a big challenge uh, uh, where states would come back to us and saying, okay, while we do understand there is a need, but we don't have the required models, or the ability to, uh, you know, do that level of modeling work. So, but for, th thanks, Ritu, for highlighting that. Uh, Brinda, uh, quick reflection on the report, and then uh, we'll get into the, the discussion as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yudhiti. Thank you, Saloni, Tanya, and Nishwin for doing this great uh, report and everything uh, that is with data and is able to come out in this fashion, we love it um, because it puts into force a lot of aspects about states and um, the dynamism that the state energy transition journeys are looking at. Um, I feel that uh, this particular report and the set methodologies that they have evolved over the year, last two years, in the last two years, will actually provide a very good segue into interstate collaboration where they're learning from each other. We're learning about the best practices on how one state is doing better than the other or how you know, the different uh, aspects of states are uh, uh, emerging. And, and this is very important uh, to look at an exchange of these learnings need to happen at the right platforms, whether Niti IO or uh, another MOP created platform, etc. Because every state is exhibiting a diverse tapestry of, you know, climatic zones, socioeconomic status, energy mix, the resources that they have. And the consumption characteristics, a state may be rich in agriculture versus a state may, that may be rich in uh, more residential electricity consumption. So I think that kind of learning and cross-learning needs to engage and studies like this are definitely a front runner on those aspects. And I was uh, something, you know, the two things that was very uh, key in this report and I just wanted to highlight uh, is that a lot of uh, older um, analysis exercises that have been done in the past, whether it's rating or coming out, has been largely focusing around uh, decarbonization or profit and loss of a discom and, you know, how they're looking. So they're very skewed parameters, but I, I really appreciate and congratulate the team of how they have brought in multidimensional parameters which is not just looking at decarbonization, but also the power system readiness and some of the market enablers where we don't even have right quantitative data sets as of now. But that is very important when we're looking at uh, developing the state's uh, power sector. So I think this is definitely one very important uh, 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 thing that I found very interesting in the report. And second, uh, this analysis that when Neshwin was presenting, you know, it was very eye catching of how Odisha as a state who falls lowest in the decarbonization value chain tops the charts in the market enablers. I think it's a very, very high opportunity, uh, you know, that is that this particular uh, analysis presents. So, yeah, I feel that there is a lot of, you know, in-depth work that this particular report provide further for states and uh, this needs to be shared with states, energy departments, regulatory departments, DISCOMs definitely to look at and develop more tailor-made strategies for themselves. Thanks. I'll stop you. And uh, Rinda, one particular aspect which has been like you know, a lot of dimensions and parameters or uh, were wanting to be considered but due to lack of data availability, say for example, even for uh, performance of state in the short term market. We didn't have data on the GTAM, but only on GDAM uh, that was available at state level. And even for, say, for example, uh, uh, distributed renewable energy sources, only solar rooftop data at state level was still available. So there was a lot of gaps there. And to an extent, this uh, new initiative by Vasudha along with Niti Aayog, the IS database uh, uh, dashboard has addressed to an extent, but what has been your experience, you know, in expanding such data sets and what challenges do you foresee in updating and including even more data 
in uh, as part of the ICE database. Yeah. Thank you, Vibhuti. I think this is a question that we have been trying to answer at our end for almost now four years since we started this journey on creating this India Climate and Energy Dashboard. Um, the ICE implementation story has been a quite a mixed bag. So while um, <clears throat> the experience of coming up with an all-encompassing dashboard and using and as we look at the Google Analytics, et cetera, of parts of how this is going and, you know, how people are using it across not in just India, but globally, it is very, uh, you know, it's a very great feeling and successful outcome. But, you know, it has come up with its own challenges, set of challenges. And, and, and I would like to just give you a little bit, um, you know, brief that while when we look at and we talk about that data is an issue and data is a problem i would like to put it here on record that uh, data on the supply side is definitely available and it is good data that is being captured and we have tried to look at but what that data requires is aggregation and putting it in formats and uh, analysis which makes more sense for policy makers for financiers or for uh, you know experts or researchers like us to you know use that information uh, properly and 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 some of the challenges uh, that we you know felt in this aggregation is like you know looking at the data uh, from the discom and you know we see that over 500 to 600 tariff orders we looked at in the past uh, for capturing the historical narrative of the electricity distribution sector and all of them were in pdf mode so how do you look at you know bringing them to formats and alignments that makes more sense and and and, and i'm sure that a lot of people here as well as um, across they have used the dashboard to look at how the journey for various discoms have been changing you know andhra pradesh gujarat how their power procurement uh, has been changing um now uh, and then definitely there have been issues looking at data formats data validation you know you get one data from one website one government website and then you try to match with other sometimes there are data discrepancies you need consultations you need discussions and niti ayog has definitely been a very very good partner and organization and uh, you know to take this forward and <clears throat> One very important thing is that when you're maintaining a dashboard like this and which is capturing that kind of real time data, it requires continuous tracking of sources. And, and this is not because there is only like one parameter. We are looking at over more than 2000 parameters and more than three to 4000 infographics that ICT is generating. Um, now, as we go ahead and we, know we want to expand this data sets to include more demand side, so the challenge is for real because the most important part is that when we are talking about data and as Ritu uh, I'm also indicated, we need more access and availability to not just state level data, but district level data, sub-national data, which includes city level data. And there is very limited data availability. And when we talk about end use, you know, what is the kind of air conditioning load or what is the kind of uh, fuel usage by a vehicle category, what has been the MSME consumption, I think those all those data sets are not there as of now. There are only few sources which talks about those data sets, especially, you know, let's say in the industry sector, we have some discussion and data being collected in the end use as part of the PAT scheme. And we have some set of representation from the MSME in the form of the annual survey of industries that captures its data. But all of that is a very uh, limited data set. So how do we expand building on certain data sets and start building with this? Because we feel that there's a lot of work that the national level agencies have done uh, in terms of making data uh, on end use, but there is needs to be some credible efforts need to be taken at state level now as well, and not only rely on national level organizations to manage end use data or look at end use data collection processes, because it goes down more at a district level when we are looking at the decarbonization or net zero at state level also. Um, second is when we are looking at uh, demand side data, it is very important to see that there are multiple data sources and there is complexities associated. So when I'm looking at industries, they are multifaceted. The way you are capturing for industries, you need different, uh, you know, to in under to understand their trends or to understand their uh, growth. You need different kinds of uh, data sets. So we need an RBI, we need a um, uh, uh, ASI and we need ministries together to understand how an industry is growing in a particular state and how clean it is in its process and <clears throat> this is something that and then my and and one thing that we feel is that something of a data kind of an agency 
you know, like TNGCC is there in Tamil Nadu, which has been looking at specific projects. Something like that can be created at a state level, which can look at this coordination of not just data, but projects specifically to decarbonization. And lastly, I think one important challenge, which, uh, you know, as a whole, we need to address is on data frequency and data gaps. So we see a lot of reports like, you know, where they come at a different frequency. So when you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, understanding that data in a wholesome, that gives you different uh, kinds of challenges and you're not able to realize. So I'll give you this example of uh, diesel power agriculture pump set data, which is released by uh, the agriculture census in an input survey. That data goes back to only 2016-17. So if I want to understand the trajectory of how India has moved, I don't have those data sets. Um, so, and then when I'm looking at industry, a lot of it gets specified, a lot of industrial emissions, a lot of industrial consumption gets uh, located to uh, fuel consumption. So we have to see how we look at these non-specified categories also. So yeah. This is something that, you know, we are trying to look at and ultimately answer four big questions on data. One, what is the data relevance? Why do we need the data? Second, data availability. Where are the sources? Third, data sensitivity. How do I classify data as being sensitive and being used? And last, on data management, I think. So these are the four levers where we look at and, and our trajectory on data is there. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, for pointing uh, all the hard work that you've undertaken and the kind of issues that you face and going forward, how you are tackling with it. And definitely we need to get into more granular level information and the availability of that uh, with the district level. So hopefully we'll get there uh, 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 and that transparency is going to be there. Thanks. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, Dr. Sinha, uh, coming back to you. You know, especially for greater adoption of renewable energy, we are seeing increasing liquidity in the short term market can be key as it is variable in nature. Our report kind of underscores a significant deficit in state participation within the short term electricity market and within the short term, particularly in the green market segment. So. Coming from the DISCOM's perspective, you know, I would want to hear, is it possible to gradually, you know, shift away from long-term power purchase contracts in the future uh, and help in market better market participation for renewable energy in the short-term market? What are the challenges if not, if uh, it's difficult to move from long-term power purchase agreements uh, um, and, or what could be the enablers that can help DISCOMs finally shift from this existing kind of arrangement, which is kind of legacy issue that we have always been talking about, which has been kind of a bottleneck for DISCOMs to buy more and more renewable energy? Uh, very good question, uh, Vibhuti. Uh, I think um, uh, today in, uh, we live in a very, very controlled environment uh, whereby uh, the DISCOMs will come with a bid and then uh, against the bid people uh, are submitting their bids and uh, it's a long term take or pay obligation of PPA which gets entered. But uh, I think uh, uh, what is important is that we need to create the market. So whether it is the market for GTAM, GDAM or even um, uh, under the, uh, 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 the ancillary market that can be created. Uh, none of those are happening. And that is because the enforcement of the RPO uh, has not taken place, whether it is enforcement at the uh, distribution companies level or it is at the uh, industrial users and others uh, who have been classified that they also need to meet the RPO obligation. So I think uh, till such time we do not have uh, enforcement mechanism, uh, they would not be people will not be penalized if they do not go for uh, renewable power through open access or go through the market. And uh, and that's why uh, uh, there is today very little market which is there because no one wants to go and set up a merchant power plant because if you have to set up a merchant power plant, you need to know very clearly whether they will be an off-taker for that in the market or not. 
today uh, if uh, you sell it uh, not as green power but you sell it as a brown power and uh, there is nothing no benefit per se that you get uh, if you sell it as a green power so uh, until and unless the proper market creation takes place secondly uh, the future markets have not happened in india uh, while there has been a lot of discussion and there was also a turf war between CRC and SEBI that uh, who would uh, be the uh, owner of the future market. So while the actual trade will be with so-called CRC, the market will be with uh, SEBI and they still have not been able to sort out, uh, though the case was there in Supreme Court for more than 10, 11 years. So I think we need to create that also whereby there is a future. So, and uh, that will make the uh, the exchanges more deep. Uh, there will be a demand for uh, these type of products. And I do know that a lot of people come to me and say that, uh, uh, especially some of the international companies who ha have been signatories of RE100, and they would like uh, that uh, they meet their renewable obligation. They are not able to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I think uh, it's a question of uh, uh, creating the right ecosystem wherein uh, you have the opportunity to sell in the exchange, while today there is not, none like that. And uh, uh, this is definitely a necessity. In fact, uh, there has been a lot of discussions in the last many years that can we have 100% supply of power through the exchange on merit order basis rather than on the uh, existing long-term PP arrangement. Uh, while there have been discussions, uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, the CRC or the government has been able to take this step forward, but, but this is something which will eventually happen. Uh, I do hope uh, the new government will take some of these initiatives, uh, especially the amendment to the Electricity Act, wherein some of these aspects of uh, penalty if people do not comply to the RPO obligations. And this is including industries and large consumers, uh, commercial consumers, more than 10 megawatt. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see a much deeper and a much wider market uh, going forward for renewables. Yeah, because also there's no incentive for states which have exceeded the RPOs as well. So uh, while some states have not met their RPO obligation, but there are other states which have huge potential and they can exceed the RPO, but there's no incentive for those states to, you know, even exceed their RPO obligation. So yes, uh, I think uh, enforcement becomes very, very essential in that case. Uh, and maybe uh, having very different RPOs for RE rich states, especially uh, while there are some changes, but definitely we need to push them even more hard. Similarly, uh, Dr. Sana, there was one question uh, and thank you to the authors who have been answering to all the questions in the Q&A box very, very promptly. And I saw that more than 24, 25 questions have already been answered. So thank you. But there's one question similar to, you know, when we were talking about RPO, but even the resource adequacy guidelines have put strong emphasis on long-term and medium-term based power and not short-term short power. So do you see that that would also change in the coming uh, months and year? Yeah, it, it's a question of mindset change. So resource adequacy does not mean that you need to have a long-term power purchase agreement. Uh, it means that you do a planning of how you will have just... Uh, uh, an equitable supply of power uh, going forward. So I think uh, that aspect uh, and has to be covered in the plans for uh, all the states. Only few states have completed that exercise. And also the monitoring of its implementation. Many of the states are still not uh, implementing to the extent that they had come as per their plan. So I think uh, uh, there is a very big opportunity and especially now that uh, everyone is talking of 24-7 uh, renewable power, uh, there is that much more necessity and that much more demand for that sort of power which would be there. Because while you would go and tie up a certain quantum of power for certain hours in a day, you would not be able to do it for all the 96 slots in a day. 
And that's where the uh, exchange will be able to play a very, very important role. And the RTAM and RDAM, I think, uh, can really play a, a critical role if we have to really uh, transition to 24-7 renewable power. Right. Uh, also, sir, in terms of, you know, uh, there have been instances with certain discoms, you know, imposing certain charges, which has led to, say, for example, uptake of solar ro rooftop, not in a big way, because, uh, you know, consumers are disincentivized uh, by imposition of so many different charges, uh, or not allowing or uh, having very progressive green open access policies. So how do you think, uh, you know, the discoms can be encouraged so that more and more RE adoption happens going forward? So coming from the discom mindset, I know we need a fine balance because they can't do away with their cash rich customers. Uh, how do we ensure a fair balance where the interests of all the stakeholders are taken into account? I think uh, this is inevitable. Uh, people can delay the approvals, but uh, I, uh, it is a matter of time that people will transition because not only it is uh, more economical to go for rooftop or even for group captive solutions for larger consumers, but also uh, people can uh, go for, uh, uh, the individual houses can go for rooftop. So uh, I, I don't think uh, 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 people can run away from this. The writing is very much on the wall. And uh, the recent uh, announcement of Prime Minister on the PM Sorry uh, Sorry Energy program, which is there, is uh, I think uh, that will uh, possibly uh, precipitate the whole uh, speed at which uh, the rooftop solar can happen. So decentralized generation uh, is a great solution, and uh, there is no point in uh, delaying it or deferring it. Uh, because uh, everyone is losing money in this. Uh, and uh, it's a disruption, which uh, I think uh, the DISCOMs should take it up uh, as a part of uh, their future planning, that how uh, they become the supplier of last resort and uh, do the balancing of supply that needs to be done. But uh, going forward, uh, this should be the way. And uh, more and more people need to be encouraged that they should go for decentralized and distributed energy resources. Great. Uh, on that positive note, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and especially the audience who have been very, very active. And I can see there has been a lot of questions and uh, authors have been uh, responding to it. But if there is still any uh, question which has been unanswered, please, please feel free to write to us. We will take those questions up with either of the authors or with the panelists. Uh, but thank you all for, uh, uh, you know, as I said, being very active audience today. I will now hand it over to Aditya for the concluding remarks. Aditya, yeah. over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vibhuti. And uh, first of all, let me place on record a very big thank you to Everybody in the in the in the panel, uh, Dr. Praveer, Dr. Ritu, uh, Ms. Brenda, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Abhishek, uh, was, was had to uh, leave in the middle. Thank you very much, especially because uh, these comments have been quite insightful and the discussion has been uh, quite thought provoking. And it was particularly useful to get specific uh, suggestions on how this report could be evolved and used going forward to influence uh, action change. So I, I may be sitting here to. Uh, uh, close this webinar, but we would actually love to see this as the beginning of uh, a conversation that is very much necessary for India's transition. Uh, and, and, and like Dr. Praveer uh, advised, uh, this report should now be uh, taken to the next level through recommendation uh, uh, to say, and Dr. Ritu also mentioned that we uh, the, like we now need to move to the how from, uh, from the what. And that's exactly uh, the vision of this report. In fact, a report or analysis like this can only be useful if it turns into a conversation. And what is clear uh, is that India's power sector transition, um, like, you know, it's kind of uh, begun. And uh, what is also clear is that uh, for India to ramp up its uh, renewables uptake to meet a 500 gigawatt target or even possibly exceed it, as, Dr. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Ranjan uh, alluded to, it requires all the states to also kind of uh, move together. In this analysis, we found that there were a hand handful of states which are actually driving transition at the moment. Uh, there are different states and different stages of transition. 
uh, but uh, we also found that you know uh, there are benefits to transition which uh, the the front movers or the prime movers are actually accessing and that's a key thing to uh, keep in mind that the transition is proving to be beneficial not just in indian say but also across the world and uh, policy makers of 2024 they do have options they have options to accelerate and access uh, these benefits uh, of course delivering on this promise will also require a lot of collaboration uh, between the states uh, a lot of uh, cross learnings like uh, ms brinda emphasized on and that's something which uh, which needs to kind of uh, needs to be encouraged and, and and think tanks like ours also need to be actively facilitating that uh, and if i can borrow uh, dr ritu's analogy uh, like it is necessary to move uh, if, if forward as an interconnected uh, india and that's probably the way we need to uh, look at this as well india's electricity demand is also uh, stated to grow in the next uh, couple of decades so grids and grid flexibility they become um, uh, an important and uh, important aspect of the story but equally important would be developing a holistic plan uh, to transition like all the panel members uh, seem to be uh, suggesting as well um so yeah uh, of course this report uh, uh, like you know shows that uh, like there are various parameters that one needs to consider uh, to achieving transition and it is integral to track and uh, measure transition and if i may plug uh, embers uh, embers global electricity review of 2024 is due on 8th of may which is which does exactly that for different countries across the the world as well but we hope uh, this report specifically gives everybody uh, an opportunity to start discussions around uh, various aspects of transition and bring more visibility to progress across uh, different states uh, we'd also like to encourage everybody to go through the analysis and use the data uh, that we compiled as uh, so, uh, some of the authors uh, like you know, mentioned in their presentations uh, the results presented are just scraping the surface there are several stories especially specific to certain states which are waiting to be explored in the data sets uh, that we put together uh, so we really encourage you to like you know dig through them we're also open to feedback thoughts uh, ideas that can uh, uh, like you know, make this analysis even more uh, robust we are uh, constantly trying to evolve this and turn it into something which is uh, usable to influence uh, change So with that uh, let me uh, also thank you all for your time and interest and uh, yeah look forward to uh, keeping the conversation uh, going thank you so much everybody thank you everyone and a special thanks to all the panelists thank you for joining us today thank you thank you thank you selwani and thank you sir and uh, dr mapur thank you